Good evening, everyone. I'm Trey Johnson, museum educator for the Kansas Historical Society. And for the first time ever, I am not coming to you live from the Kansas Museum of History. I'm currently positive with COVID-19 and to protect the health and safety of others, I'm broadcasting right here from my home. As we all know, the show must go on. Tonight, we will be joined by Dr. Eric Anderson, who holds a doctorate in American history from the University of Kansas, specializing in American Indian cultures and the history of the United States West. He's an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and teaches at Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. His major research focus is on American Indian education, especially the system of federal boarding schools established for native youth in the late 19th century. After the presentation, we will host a question and answer period that will allow you to interact with Dr. Anderson. As questions pop into your mind throughout the presentation, feel free to pose them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Anderson will present Haskell Institute, Assimilation and Persistence, 1884 to 1909, examining the roots of federal policies that created a system of boarding schools for American Indian youth beginning in the late 19th century. These schools focused on assimilating native children into mainstream US society by stripping away ties to traditional cultures and communities. Life at school was often a harsh and difficult experience with mixed results. Despite the widespread network of schools and multiple generations of Indian students who attended them, native cultures persisted and remain alive today. Although the legacy of this re-education impacted American Indian and Alaska Native people deeply. Haskell Indian Nations University, which emerged from Haskell Institute, is now a place for Native-centered education that celebrates the history and traditions of Indigenous nations while focusing on the needs of contemporary Native American communities and people. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Eric Anderson. Good evening. Thank you so much for the very nice introduction, Trey, and we are all sorry to know that you can't um, be in your usual position of broadcasting from the museum, but as you say, the show must go on. And I thank also uh, Lois here and Kansas Historical Society for inviting me to do this. I hope that um, before too much longer, we can dispense with mandatory uh, virtual meetings, uh, or at least uh, be in a place where we, we can, uh, some of us be together. Um, and in the meantime, it's nice that we have the technology to facilitate events like this. So thanks to each of you who have joined tonight uh, and to take a little time out of your Friday evening. Um, it's just started raining here in Lawrence and I don't know what it's doing in the rest of the listening and viewing area, but maybe it's a good night to be in. What I wanted to talk with you tonight um, was very, very well covered in the introduction, but I'd like to stop and, and pause for just a minute about that title because assimilation is really uh, what the name of the game was in terms of federal policy with regard to um, impacting and changing American Indian peoples and cultures, um, certainly beginning in the late 19th century and uh, pretty much without uh, respite until changes came along in the, the New Deal period uh, of the 1930s. And then the persistence piece, you know, as, as Trey stated, um, we're still here. Uh, that's, that's the key to this, despite the attempts to re-educate and uh, reformulate and remake American Indian people in the image of the dominant Euro-American society, uh, we still remain. So that's kind of the, the introduction that I would give, um, just to add a little bit to what um, has already been said. And I, this is something that I can talk about uh, at, at length, um, I want to uh, you know, adhere to a, a pretty tight time frame so that there is um, a period that we can have a discussion as well. Uh, 
but I'll go through my slides and, and um, keep watching the clock. And um, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that I get a lot of information in there. But when we're talking about 25 years of history, the formative history of Haskell Institute, what's now Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, um, you know, that, that we're really talking about uh, 25 years that I have about um, that much time to spend a minute on each year. So um, hopefully there will be a lot of room for questions um, and things that, that I'm not able to cover directly as I go through the slides. Well, now I'm having an issue with getting these to advance. Trey, any suggestions? Uh, let's let's see. So, uh, have you hit the screen share button down at the bottom of the screen? Yeah, that was my problem. See, I thought it was all ready to go. Let's try it again. Oh, oh wow. look at that! <laughs> yeah, and there we want to change that. How about it? Now I think we should be in business. That look good. That looks perfect. Okay. Wouldn't be a virtual meeting without some kind of a technical glitch, right? And usually it's operator error. So there's my hopefully one mistake for the evening. Um, this is a picture of, of the what you would have seen entering the Haskell campus um, around probably towards the, the later period that I'm discussing here tonight, um, the early 20th century. And I put this in here um, because I think when you see this arch and these buildings in the background, you see the superintendent's house over to the, the right hand side of the screen as you look at it. And some of the school buildings, I mean, it looks like kind of a welcoming place. And what actually was taking place within these uh, walls once you pass through that archway uh, would have been very foreign and unfamiliar um, to uh, most of the students uh, who came here and who came for a variety of reasons and through a lot of different mechanisms that we can discuss. And then here's another picture a little bit earlier, probably about 1895 uh, of Haskell. This would be if you're familiar with Lawrence, mm, approximately looking south from about um, 23rd and Lenard streets. All right, Dr. Anderson, it looks like we, we can only see your title slide. So we are not seeing the, uh, the photos that you're speaking about. Oh, well, so it wasn't my only mistake of the night. Okay. All right, there we go. So we've got the bird's eye view. Okay. All right, that should be right. So let me just go back one. That was the art way. Yeah, there awesome. we go. Yeah, sorry. I'm using two screens and apparently I <laughs> reversed them. So there's that archway I was talking about. And you see the superintendent's house over on the right, some of the school buildings in there. And then this is that bird's eye view, southward looking from about 23rd and Lenard streets today. And one of the things that you notice about this is, um, well, for one thing, the campus is small compared to what it is today in terms of buildings, a lot of it's farmland, but it's also very isolated from the rest of the community. And this is on purpose. Um, the um, people who, supported the idea of an Indian school uh, in, in Lawrence uh, only took that idea so far. Um, they did not want it to be in the heart of the city. Um, as you know now, it's very much in the thick of things. But when we talk about um, 125 years ago, it, it's pretty far out there. And so it's isolated. Um, and I think there was a, a real intention to keep it at arm's length from the community itself. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of people who were formative in the um, founding of Haskell. Uh, one uh, kind of from afar uh, and one a little more close up. And the first of those is Richard Henry Pratt, some of you may have heard of, who was the founder and longtime superintendent of the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And Pratt worked with uh, Indian prisoners of war um, after the, the uh, Red River War uh, on the Southern Plains. So we're talking Kiowa, Comanche, Cheyennes, uh, who were removed to a prison in Fort Augustine, 
um, uh, uh, Fort Marion, rather, St. Augustine, Florida. And um, Pratt had this kind of novel idea, I guess you could say. Uh, he was a bit of a maverick uh, for the time. As you can see, he was a soldier. Uh, so he had experience um, in the Civil War and then, and then working with these prisoners of the United States government after the war. But he had a little bit different view of Indians than most people did at the time. Um, again, though, only up to a point. And Pratt's idea was that Indians were actually human um, and that they were educable. Uh, whereas most people saw Indians as a nuisance at the very least, an obstacle, uh, certainly, or <clears throat> something to be done away with entirely. So Pratt convinced um, some people in the government to, to give him these barracks, in these abandoned military barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, after he was discharged from his duty working with these prisoners. And um, he kind of implemented some of the same things he'd done with them, uh, which was um, to introduce them to um, concepts of Christianity, English, certainly, and some rudimentary uh, academic education. And Pratt's idea became the model for a whole system of government schools that arose in the wake of his founding Carlisle in 1879. And so the second person that's important here as kind of an architect of Haskell is Dudley Haskell. Dudley Haskell is the person for whom the school is named. And he was um, a congressional representative from um, the area that, um, that Lawrence is in. Uh, he was a pretty young man uh, when he became chairman of the um, House Committee on Indian Affairs. And um, there was this kind of um, groundswell of support, um, at least among a, a certain sector of um, the American public. Um, I wouldn't say the dominant portion of the public was behind it, but there was a, a kind of a humanitarian trend towards this educational idea, rather than pursuing a policy of warfare, instead to pursue one of assimilation and re-education. Uh, Haskell ended up <clears throat> um, um, dying suddenly, uh, and the school that he helped shepherd to his um, district um, that had originally been called the Indian Industrial Training School at Lawrence soon took on the name Haskell Institute. So that's where that comes from. And of course, Haskell is the um, <clears throat> progenitor of um, Haskell Indian Nations University it built on Pratt's model. And Pratt is kind of a master of uh, what we would call PR now. And he liked to use, among other things, photos to publicize uh, what he saw as his great success at um, civilizing Indians. And I, of course, put those words in quotation marks because um, you know, these are very biased terms. Uh, when we say um, you're educating someone, it, it, it kind of um, assumes they don't have a system of education. Uh, when we talk about civilizing, it comes from the point of view of uh, one's own perception of what civilization means. Uh, so Pratt, you know, was a, a bit of a zealot, um, you could say, but he was very instrumental in changing uh, the way that many people thought about Indians. And of course, he used um, these photos that I'm about to show you some examples of um, that were a yardstick for his success. And so here you see on the left uh, an Indian student, Navajo or Diné, as he arrived at um, Carlisle and then after four years at Carlisle. And obviously it's a, a fairly dramatic change uh, in appearance. Now, what, um, how much we can say has changed you know, within um, the spirit of that person is, is, is probably quite another story. Um, these schools became a, a really popular mandate uh, of the government. And this, I know it's very hard to see much detail on this map, but it gives you a pretty good idea of the reach of federally supported Indian schools by the close of the 19th century. Um, most of them are in the West. Uh, only a few really um, are east of the Mississippi. Um, and of course, that's where most Indians were located at the time, having been by and large pushed out of the East. 
Um, now this map shows the whole range of federal schools. So you have um, day schools on the reservation, you have reservation boarding schools, and then you have the uh, off reservation schools. And this was envisioned as sort of a, 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 a you know, a tri-tiered system where, you know, students would kind of graduate from one to the next, eventually winding up in these, again, quotation marks, elite off-reservation schools, which were generally fairly far away from home. And you can see um, there in Kansas is Haskell, and there are about 25 of these schools, uh, these federal off-reservation or non-reservation schools by uh, the dawn of the 20th century. So it becomes a, uh, a very popular and, and far reaching um, system within about 20 years of the founding of Carlisle. Now, Pratt and others believed that these non reservation schools would be the best because um, he felt like, and others too, that, that uh, Indians who were allowed to remain. And these are young Indians, as you can see from this picture, although there's a range of age, but mostly towards the youngish side. Um, if they were allowed to remain near their homes, they would just sort of fall back into the old ways of doing things. And he also believed in very regimented order. And so here at Haskell, you see this picture from around, uh, around probably 1900, early 1900s, um, a pretty large school, you know, composed of uh, both boys and girls, young men, young women. Uh, you see the, uh, the building, uh, Hiawatha Hall, that's still on our campus, uh, the oldest building on our campus there in the background towards, kind of towards the left. Uh, and you also notice this very military flavor of the school, the boys in uh, military type of uniforms. And that always is striking to me. Um, what would what would Native parents have thought seeing their children in these, these uniforms that... Um, you know, were um, reflective of, of what for many of them had been um, the enemy you know, not too long before. You think about the Battle of Little Bighorn only being three years prior to the opening of Carlisle. And again, here are some pictures of those military drills. So it's a really regimented kind of life that these young Indians are being exposed to. They're living by the bell. They are being um, summoned awake uh, with reveille, you know, trumpet blast in the morning and, and um, um, being sent to bed uh, with the sound of taps. Uh, so it's really a very structured environment. Um, it's one that um, adheres very much to the clock time, which would be very different, very foreign for um, most native people at the time. And again, it does focus on the very young Pratt's idea taking hold that the only way you're going to really change Indian people is to get a hold of them at a very young age and removing them from the perceived harmful influence of home. So that means that very young children, um, we would think of as, as preschool, uh, even age, uh, are coming to places like Haskell um, and remaining for many years. Uh, and of course, they're not all this age, as you saw in a couple pictures back. Um, there's a very wide range and they're sort of grouped in the early years uh, according to their level of exposure to uh, white society, to um, English, to Christianity, uh, and to any kind of education reflective of uh, Western modes of, of thought and expression. So you might have a very young person, you know, a, a five or six or seven year old in the same grade, so to speak, uh, as someone maybe five or 10 years older than that. Um, and what I'm kind of trying to get at there is um, not just the focus of the system, but the fact that it's really quite haphazard. Uh, it's not very, um, even though you have that regimentation, the military flavor of the school, there's not a lot of um, professionalization. And this is a very limited education. Again, the main focus on speaking English, which a lot of the incoming students didn't speak at all, uh, on Christianity, which we you know, might think of as, as uh, 
kind of perplexing given our, our long history of separation of church and state. Um, and also the fact that if you're trying to assimilate people, re-educate them, giving them only the very most basic education uh, probably is, is um, in, in some ways doomed to failure. So it's a very haphazard um, system. And it's one also that has um, you know, real uh, effects uh, because this is our cemetery at Haspel. You see um, the headstones there. I'm happy to say we have cleaned it up a little since this picture was taken. Um, but it's a reminder of this sacrifice that these young children uh, were making uh, in the name of government policy and perhaps in the name of trying to make um, what was often a very desperate situation back at home better because the reservations were were very dismal in terms of economic opportunity uh, and um, any kind of social mobility. So it's a, um, a reason that not all students were um, compelled or forced to come. Some of them were, uh, but some of them were volunteers uh, who had the idea of um, making a better future. And, and here you see um, examples of those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the name of doing so. And illness, uh, epidemics of disease uh, were, were rampant uh, in the early years. So most of the headstones in this graveyard come from um, certainly the first 25, 30 years. Um, there are a few outliers. I think the last one is in maybe the 1950s. And I wanna say there are 109 headstones. Um, it may seem a little unusual too, to think of a, a, a school for young people uh, having its own graveyard, but um, fairly common at Indian schools. Some of you are aware of um, the discovery of mass graves at some of the residential schools in Canada over the last uh, year or so. Uh, and um, the probability that um, you know there are undiscovered graves uh, at some of our boarding schools here in the United States. Um, beyond those basic things, um, English, Christianity, and um, you know what people would have called once upon a time the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, Haskell students were engaged about the other half of their day in what was called manual labor training or industrial training. And so I'm gonna show you some examples here of that. Some of the shops, the tailor shop, paint shop, wagon making. Interesting too, when I think about this, you know, that uh, if we're talking, this, these pictures are from the 1890s. Um, it's already a time when automobiles are starting to appear even in, in, in pretty sizable numbers in Kansas. Um, so some of these skills may not be the most applicable that students are being trained in. This is an interesting one, this Lloyd shop, and we can go back and talk about it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this, it's kind of an old fashioned term, um, but it was a, a, a means of instruction that was very popular in Scandinavia and it was kind of exported here. Um, and so here you see students working in this, this Sloyd program and they're doing carpentry and other things. Um, one thing I might note is that through a good bit of Haskell's early history, um, this training was uh, segregated along uh, gender lines uh, with boys, for instance, being trained as tailors and girls working in, for instance, a sewing room. Uh, but here we have something that um, is really notable for me. Uh, not just the fact that you see boys and girls or young men and young women together, but this represents something that is um, some real change afoot at Haskell. So by the late 1890s, uh, there is an introduction of some more advanced education. And the reason that it's notable for me is because based on my research, I really believe that it's the native students and their families and their support networks 
uh, themselves who are pushing for this increased education. You know, uh, even though most uh, Americans, Native and, and non-Native alike, uh, remained in rural settings and uh, were still farmers uh, by and large until World War I came along and things began to change and more urbanization. Um, I think it's clear that there is a need for training beyond just the very most basic. So what you see here is a shorthand class. And this was part of what was called the commercial department, what we might call a business program today. In fact, the first um, typewriting class in the state of Kansas was taught at Haskell. So you do see some beginnings of change. And when I think about the history of Haskell, it really is an evolution. And it's an evolution that I would argue um, Native students and Native people uh, really have a, a, a hand in. Uh, they are, maybe we could call it a hidden hand. Uh, they have limited ability to change the system, but changes they did. Um, and sometimes with fits and starts because the commercial program and then also um, something else that developed along the same time, a normal school or what we would call an education program today, um, also offered that uh, more advanced curriculum. But neither of these programs lasted very long before it kind of reverted back to the old, more narrow focus. However, I do think it, it opened some doors that would not entirely uh, be closed or we could say would open back up again. And there's another picture from the commercial apartment. Again, most of these photos are from the mid 1890s. And here we see the normal kindergarten and in fact, probably some of the, the older students um, acting as, as student teachers of younger ones. Sports also became a big part of the Haskell story. And um, Carlisle was the first one to bring football onto the scene. And Pratt kind of hemmed and hawed about letting his students play football because it was a much, much more violent and uh, brutal game uh, in its infancy than it is today. Um, but of course, this is Kansas, so basketball, have to have basketball, right? Uh, but Haskell did have um, football as well, and Haskell became um, very well known for its football program. And what could be all, Amer all more American than more all-American than baseball. So here you have the Haskell nine. And on the, the right-hand side there, they are sitting in front of the gazebo that's still on our campus. Obviously, it's been renovated a number of times, but it's still a centerpiece of the quad. Um, Pratt and others really did come to see sports as being um, another way that um, they could publicize the success of the schools, uh, what Indians could do. And this was especially true as um, Haskell and Carlisle and others became real powerhouses, particularly in football, but also in other sports uh, and began to play white teams. Um, Haskell in the 1920s was regularly playing KU and MU and Bucknell and Notre Dame and, and more often than not beating them. Uh, and, and these are, of course, college teams when Haskell at that point really uh, was um, a high school program uh, at, at best. And then, of course, football. And we all, I think, know the name of Jim Thorpe. And Carlisle claims Jim Thorpe. But actually, we had him first. He attended Haskell for a few years uh, and he didn't really like it that much. So when he got tired of it, he would walk home back to Oklahoma. Um, and his father really wanted him to have an education, wanted him to have a, uh, uh, an education in the 
ways of the dominant society. And so he decided at a certain point to send him to Carlisle, uh, figuring he wasn't gonna be able to walk all the way back from Pennsylvania. Um, and, and I'm making a little bit of light there um, because we have to have some uh, humor and grace in this discussion because it's a difficult topic uh, when we think about what um, these students faced, um, the uh, drudgery of work uh, in sometimes questionable ways where they were actually building and maintaining the school. Um, when they were faced with um, punishment, heavy handed discipline for being um, caught speaking their own languages or trying to practice their own um, spiritual or cultural beliefs. Um, it's a difficult topic when we think about the degree of, of disease and death. And um, so running away was not uncommon or leaving the school to return home uh, was not an uncommon practice. And um, sometimes uh, they were caught. Um, certainly the school employed kind of bounty hunters to bring them back. Uh, I don't have a picture of it in this uh, particular presentation, but uh, there is a, a child-sized pair of handcuffs in our cultural center. Uh, it gives you an idea of um, you know, the, the kind of um, punishments and, and kind of life that they face. There are a lot of um, <clears throat> legacies of boarding schools that are still with us when we think about changes to um, uh, holding on to our indigenous languages. Uh, when we think about cycles of dysfunction that were created in abusive um, institutions, um, in institutions that are just that, you know, they're cold places. Uh, they did not um, spend a great deal of money on supporting the students um, because not everybody was on board. Not everyone saw Indians as being uh, worth uh, redemption or worth uh, assimilating. Uh, and so diet was poor, leading to uh, cycles of disease. Uh, of course, you know, you can imagine the homesickness being so far away from home, um, not really having any kind of parental uh, role models. And so, um, you know, the children are kind of left um, to their own devices to know what it means to, um, you know, to be loved, uh, to be nurtured and cared for. So it is a, a grim story in many ways, um, but it is ultimately a story of persistence. Um, and one uh, that we uh, learn from. Um, here's a, a picture of an early graduating class, 1893. You still see the, the military style uniform, certainly Victorian uh, appearance of um, dress. Um, here is a, a photo. I've just got a, a couple more slides and then we can move over to questions because I'm sure you, you must have some. Um, this is a Pawnee student, William Pollock, uh, and um, his father, uh, William Pollock, uh, is uh, often credited with, with being the uh, person who uh, conceived of um, Haskell's um, logo, the Indian head uh, logo. And this is, I, I kind of am circling back to this because it reminds me a bit of, of Pratt's pictures, kind of before and after. Indian of the past, Indian of the future. Uh, unfortunately, William Pollock um, did not live long past his years at Haskell. Uh, he went all the way to uh, Cuba and uh, rode up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt uh, during the, the Spanish-American War and survived that only to uh, come home and die of tuberculosis. But um, I wanted to end with this picture, uh, one of my former students, and give you a sense of uh, you know, the appreciation of our traditions, uh, our multitude of traditions that still exist um, despite uh, this, this history of trying to eradicate them. And so this is a picture from where he's wearing his uh, regalia 
um, at at, um, at one of our powwows. And I want, kind of wanted to leave you with that because I, I do see hope in this story. Um, you know, even though it's been a long evolution of past school moving from a, a very rigid uh, boarding school uh, meant to, to completely change uh, Native people um, to one where they begin to have a hand in uh, changing the curriculum for themselves uh, and to speak to their own needs. Uh, moving from those early programs um, to eventually a high school kind of uh, situation in the 1920s and in the 1960s, um, uh, a junior college, and then eventually to a university today where we are celebrating uh, our heritage, our history, our cultures, our um, endurance, uh, and we have the freedom to do that. So um, I, I, I want to end there on a, on a hopeful note, and, and with that, I will Give it over to questions. All right, fantastic presentation, Dr. Anderson. Uh, if you could go ahead and stop your screen share real quick. Yeah, can do that. All right, perfect. Well, we have a ton of questions that have been rolling in this whole time. Um, so let's see. So first question, <clears throat> uh, I visited the Genoa, Nebraska Native American School. I wonder if the discovery of graves at some of such similar schools is common. Also, does this mean the students were deliberately killed or is this just a reflection of the primitive level of medical practice at the time? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I can fully answer. The thing that I find is there are probably as many different answers to uh, what boarding schools were like as there were students who went there and administrators who worked there. Um, the Genoa School, if I'm not mistaken, and I have not visited, but my, my recollection is that they have a, um, it's either a state historic site or, or maybe it has some federal funding and they have a, a cultural um, museum aspect to it. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that um, it's very common to see that level of um, disease uh, and death as an outcome thereof uh, at these schools. Um, I can't speak directly to what has not been found yet, whether that may be actual graves um, or information that could potentially be uncovered as to how students may have met their fates beyond that. But I, I can tell you anecdotally that, for instance, at Haskell in the early years, um, and I noticed someone said something about superintendents having connections to KU and, and other things that when um, Charles Robinson became, who was the first governor of Free State Kansas, uh, came to work at um, Haskell as a, as a superintendent. Um, one of the things that he first put his finger on was that there was a lot of um, um, misappropriation of um, medicines from the school infirmary that were being sold on the black market rather than um, going to the care of the students. So, I mean, that, that would be an anecdote um, to, you know, there, there's, certainly some some malice there I, I, I would say um, you know maybe it's just a lack of concern but um, the outcome uh, probably resulted in death so um, and and as for others I think too about um, you know some of those students who who left the school and, and maybe just never made it home and we don't really know what happened to them you know right. Haskell used to be a whole bunch bigger than it is um, we had hundreds of acres out to the south and those are wetlands a good part of them so you know, it's very possible that there could be um, undiscovered uh, graves out there too, or, or, or bodies, I guess, you know, they weren't meant to be graves, but kids who just couldn't, you know, make it back or make it through those conditions. We all know the weather can change like a dime here, on you know, a dime here in Kansas. So but it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer, but, but I think with Secretary Holland's initiative, um, you know, we're, we're at least um, determined to find out more about that. Well, thank you. Um, 
how did someone get selected to attend Haskell? Yeah, another good one. Um, <laughs> You know, I would say we could break it into several broad categories. Um, we do definitely hear stories of people who are, um, for lack of a better word, coerced uh, to come. Uh, and that can happen uh, in a number of different ways. Um, certainly there were unscrupulous uh, super or, um, um, reservation agents uh, who um, were trying to fulfill quotas um, uh, that the government was asking them to fulfill. Uh, and um, they did it in ways that um, were pretty questionable, like withholding rations from parents until they you know, gave up uh, children. Um, others came for different reasons, though, and, and, and like Pratt comes back to mind. Um, when he received permission to use the Carlisle barracks, um, there was no compulsion to get the students to come to school. And so he had to go out there and convince them. And he had to convince their parents to you know, give up their kids, which is a lot to ask. Um, and he did that in a lot of different ways. You know, um, he made promises, um, you know, that they would be treated very well, just like they were his own children. And his intentions may have been good. Um, it didn't always work out that way, obviously. There are a number of, of deaths recorded at Carlisle, it has its own cemetery. Um, but he also wanted to impress on uh, Native people things like if they had this education, then you know, um, maybe they would have more knowledge. Um, uh, they wouldn't have been built out of land um, and um, uh, signed treaties that um, um, did not redound to their benefit. Now that's a little naive <clears throat> because there's a lot more going on there than just lack of knowledge. Um, you know, a lot of those treaties were, were pretty much forced upon tribes who are already in a pretty um, dire straits. Um, then there are others um, who, you know, the parents um, who um, kind of, you know, maybe thought they saw the writing on the wall that you know, some of the, the old ways were not going to survive. And the only way to um, uh, uh, propagate the next generation of, of Native people was to, you know, take on some of this education. I mean, you even have people like Geronimo, who um, is certainly no friend of the United States government, but um, he believed that uh, you know knowing your enemy is is worthwhile. So, so you have a range of, of different kind of um, reasons for why and how students got there, and um, it's 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 endlessly fascinating to continue to dig into that research and and um, discover those different stories. Did Shawnee Mission, Kaw Mission, and other early schools pursue the same goals of assimilation, English, Christianity, all of that, um, although with less success of keeping indigenous children captive? It's the last part of that question. Yeah, that's a that's a good one too. Um, I was gonna and thank you for bringing that up. I was gonna say when we're looking at that map of the Indian schools, you know, those are just the government ones, right? So you have all the denominational schools as well. And, and as you mentioned, or who the, the question um, was posed, um, you know, we've obviously several of those here in Kansas. So Ottawa and Carr, um, Shawnee and, and others, um, they, you know, arrived very early. Some of those were set up in the 1830s. Um, they did have a lot of the same goals. And I think it's important um, because this, this Pratt, idea and character didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, I think if we look at the whole history of um, Euro, European and Euro-American relationships with Native people, it's, there's always been an element of pushing for change, you know, to try and, and change them. Um, you know, as soon as uh, Columbus um, arrived, you know, he brought Spanish priests with them with a conversion agenda. And, and that missionary impulse, um, you know, certainly uh, was going strong in the history of the early United States. Um, so a lot of their goals were the same. Um, I'd say the big three, the English Christianity and agriculture, or at least agriculture adhering to the uh, Western concept, the European concept, the American concept, yeah, those are all the same. Um, I know um, I, I have done a work on the missions and um, 
I know that with the CAW mission, for instance, um, they were not very successful as, as, the, as the person who asked the question um, notes in um, holding the children. Um, they kind of like some things about what the missions offered, um, you know, like, like food and supplies. Um, they didn't so much like the Christianity and um, the, the labor component. Uh, and they, and of course, were not excited at all about giving up their um, you know, girls, young girls to go to these schools. Um, so, yeah, I think that's right. Um, and the schools did not have the full force of the government. They had some support, but they were largely dependent on uh, volunteerism. And, um, you know, I think they had to walk a, a fine line. And that's, that's also true, really. That's kind of my argument with, with regard to Haskell and some of the other boarding schools is that, you know, you have to have the bodies in the, in the, in the buildings in order for the schools to be a success. Um, so even though there was a, you know, a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot of terrible things that happened, um, there still had to be some tempering of that um, in order to push the, uh, the school agenda and success forward. And, and note that Haskell is the largest of the, the fully funded uh, Indian schools by the very early part of the 20th century. So we're talking you know, 500, 700, 800, 1,000 students, you know, by 1910 or 15, um, just kept growing. And I think part of that is that um, that hidden hand, that um, there's a, an ability, limited, but an ability nonetheless to change some of the dynamics of the school. Uh, it, it took a long time for us to get to where we are now. Um, but I think you can kind of trace that from the beginning. What made Haskell so unique that um, it has remained such an institution today uh, while so many others have closed? Yeah, um, I think partly because um, it did uh, very quickly become the largest school. So it, it was easily uh, recognizable, the name, you know, na the name brand, so to speak, was out <laughs> there. Um, you know, so many people came and multiple generations. Um, people met, and fell in love. You know, they had children um, uh, who also maybe went to Haskell. Um, so you have that kind of um, alma mater aspect to it. Um, also, I think, um, and again, it partly relates to the size of the school, but the diversity of, of tribes. Um, already by the early 1890s, Haskell had students from Alaska, far away as Alaska, which is wow. kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, I, I think some of the curriculum too, you know, probably um, was appealing that there were some, some possibilities that Haskell offered that maybe some of the other places did not. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't know that I can answer beyond that. I mean, it, it, that's what certainly makes Haskell unique today. Not only that we are really the, the lone survivor of, of these, you know, um, 25 or so non-reservation boarding schools established in that era, um, but that we have such diversity. I mean, even if we have you know, we live in the shadow of, of KU up the hill, you know, it has an amazing diversity. But when you think about our school with seven or 800 students, you know, representing maybe 100, 120 different tribal nations, that's, that's pretty impressive. So I think that's a big reason. <laughs> and you just answered the next question. So <laughs> amazing. Um, with, uh, with all of this different tribal representation, um, I know you did a, uh, a podcast, Pandemic on the Prairie, uh, and you mm -hmm. talked about the construction of Haskell um, mm -hmm. and how Pawnees and Cheyennes, the, the students themselves were helping build the, the building. Um, and you mentioned how their traditional enemies, were there conflicts between different, uh, differing tribal nations that, that attended schools? Yeah, I mean, I think those old animosities are very real. Um, certainly, if we're talking about that early period, um, I was just reading something about, um, I was looking at one, of, I think it was, it might have been Kansas Historical Society website about a, a battle with a, a, you know, a large group of Pawnees being 
decimated by Cheyennes and, and Kiowas. Um, so, you know, those are very real and they would have been close in memory to these early students. So it is kind of amazing when you see them, you know, these, these children working together. Um, and I'm sure that some, you know, words were exchanged and some fights broke out and things like that, and that that probably continued. You know, I, I think today, I mean, there's still something of a little bit of a teasing relationship sometimes between tribes that were uh, traditionally at odds. But I, I also think that pretty quickly it became apparent, um, you know, not only, hey, we're all in the same boat here in this, you know, educational experiment, um, but kind of we've all been, um, we've all had a similarity of experience. Uh, in our dealings with the United States government, you know, even even if the if we're talking Pawnees or Crows who acted as scouts for the United States Army, um, you know they they weren't always, you know, they certainly weren't always treated as equals um, by their um, by their white counterparts, um, but uh, or commanding officers, but also that didn't that didn't exactly benefit them in the end. So I think that, um, yeah, the realization that, you know, hey, we've all kind of had a, a difficult relationship uh, with the federal government, uh, to put it mildly, uh, it probably mitigated some of that. Very understandable. Um, got a, another question here. Uh, has there been a movement of tribes slash nations seeking to retrieve their uh, children who died um, and reinter their remains on reservations or uh, historic tribal lands. Uh, the, the person who asked this question mentions Carlisle and, mm -hmm. and three, ch three children uh, from there. Yeah. yeah, I know that that has been um, true uh, at Carlisle. Uh, I suspect uh, that will probably um, become uh, more of a common issue you know, with the um, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, with the push to get back remains and funerary items and uh, artifacts from museums. Um, you know, there's a pretty there's a pretty strong record of uh, being able to uh, make the case uh, for doing so. And, and I suspect uh, that will be applied uh, more frequently uh, going forward with relation to these, um, these school graveyards. Is there a particular tribe which makes up the majority of the pop population at Haskell. Oh, definitely, yes. Navajo is our biggest um, constituency. Um, and that makes sense because they're the largest tribe. Um, <laughs> but um, the Southwest generally makes up our biggest group. So that you know includes Pueblo and, and other um, groups from the Southwest. And um, of course, Oklahoma, just as a state. Um, because that's where so many tribal headquarters and, and nations are. Um, so I think, um, and also Kansas, I mean, since we have the four uh, reservations here, uh, and, and um, so, so we have a lot of uh, Prairie Potawatomi, for instance. Um, but yeah, even so, I mean, we, we regularly have, you know, 46, 47 states represented. That's changed a little bit. Uh, with COVID over the last couple of years uh, and doing a lot more stuff online. But um, I, I, I feel certain we'll return to that kind of uh, uh, demographic uh, when all this is, well, I don't want to say over, but whatever, <laughs> when, we, when we get to a point where it's manageable, right? And keeping my fingers crossed. Uh... Yeah. So, um, so uh, another fantastic question. Could you discuss the effect of off-reservation schools on one, 
loss of individual tribal cultures, and two, positive development of pan-Indian consciousness. Yeah, wow. yeah, that's a good one. Um, some of my colleagues find it a very dirty word when I say pan-Indian. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, I, I just, you know, it's just a multi-tribal, right? Is the, the that's, I mean, that's my understanding and my training as an historian. But some people don't like it because they, they think it means, you know, kind of a, a lumping together of, right. of various groups. And so I want to make that distinction that some people have a difference of opinion than I do, but I don't, I don't think that's a problematic term for me. Um, and I do think it's very real. I think about um, Hazel Hertzberg's wonderful book, um, you know, the, the, about Pan-Indian identity. And she talks about Haskell a lot in there, um, not just in terms of kind of how the, the early curriculum did those things like bring children of different backgrounds together um, and to see a common Indian experience, you know, even through the, the re-education itself, um, but also in leadership that came out of those boarding schools. So that you have the so-called red progressives in the you know, 1910s and 1920s, Charles Eastman, Carlos Montezuma, Gertrude Bonin, and, and others who were all products of boarding schools and who were all critics of them uh, in, in trying to um, change the, um, the focus, in trying to change the uh, approach of the schools. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, it definitely has an impact on individual tribal nations when we think about uh, loss of language and assault on culture. I mean, there's there's no question that the boarding schools did some heavy damage. Um, but um, you know, at the same time, that um, that sort of multi-tribal experience and identity um, produced um, leaders like those I mentioned, who at least to some people are kind of household names, but also you know hundreds of others people whose names that we don't readily. Um, you know, have at our fingertips, um, you know, who've, at, who've been, um, you know, got that education and was a leg up for them to become, you know, lawyers and tribal leaders and activists and, and things like that. I see it all the time with our students today, you know, that they're taking, now, albeit this is a quite different education today than they received 100 years ago, but still, I think it's part of that, that evolution you know, getting there. So yeah, I definitely see both of those things as, as being outcomes, um, that there are, um, you know, there's, there's loss that happened um, on every level, um, but also that, um, that it has uh, paved the way for some um, new opportunities as well, let's say. Well, you have absolutely knocked each and every one of these questions out of the park. Do you have time for a few more? They, they keep rolling in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, we, we do a few more. All right. All right. Um, so I've had quite a few people ask um, if it was difficult locating instructors uh, to, to work as teachers at uh, these boarding schools. Wow. Yeah. See, this is something I really think is, is a, an area that needs a lot more research. Um, the government, of course, kept pretty meticulous records, as many governments do. Um, but a lot of times, they're not very revealing. You know, so it would require, I think, you know, some, some real depth of, of work to kind of get into the backgrounds, the um, motives uh, and the temperaments of, of those teachers. Um, now there's some piecemeal things out there. And then in fact, I had a student do a capstone project uh, last semester on the issue of the um, teachers. And um, she was able to find out some really interesting things, but there's not a lot in terms of like book length studies. So it's a, right now a lot of cobbling together. Um, one of the interesting things that she discovered um, was that this 
uh, in these early years, even though women were often kind of the go-to, if you will, as, as um, teachers in primary schools and things of that nature, um, this government system really opened up a lot of opportunities for women to teach um, in uh, a different environment. Now, at the same time, some, in some ways it wasn't that different, but it quickly became a fairly professionalized um, regiment of teachers, um, say around the time it, that I kind of dropped off today, around, around the 1910 or so, it's becoming more and more and more formalized. So that I thought was pretty intriguing um, that it was, um, a, as things were shifting more generally in the society, that um, this became an opportunity for, for women to teach at a, uh, in a different kind of place than where they had traditionally been seen as, as, um, um, as the, um, what's the word I want, as the, the, that's where they would be expected to teach, right? Um, and there is something, I, I suppose, that was prestigious about Haskell that may have motivated people to come and teach there or the other schools. You know, a lot of people, I think this was an act of conscience. Um, you know, and I don't want to forget that, that there were good people in this system, sometimes thwarted by, you know, the mechanics of the system that weren't very good. Um, but I do believe, you know, some of those people had their heart in the right, but maybe many of them. Um, at the same time, I know there were others who, you know, who just was a job or, you know, they had ulterior motives. Um, and I don't want to, you know, go any further than that right now. Um, but I would just say, I, I, I think, um, based on some things that I, I've seen, you know, there, there are some people who you know, probably should not have been teaching there. They did not have the right temperament for it. So, and, and it's a system that, you know, that afforded the opportunity for abuse, you know, on, on many different levels. And I don't mean just against students, but just, you know, abuse of the system. So um, I think that's a fascinating topic. Um, I would love to find time to write a book on it, but I think it'll have to be somebody else. <laughs> Well, you have had a ton of, of appreciation flow in through the chat, uh, both in the chat panel and Q&A. Uh, tons of people thanking you for your time. Thank you. Um, and I, of course, I would like to thank you too for joining us, uh, working with us here. We're switching things up a little bit for the night, but uh, yeah. you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, and I appreciate you helping me work through the, the, the tech glitches at the beginning. I just wanted to say one last thing because I saw somebody put a final question in there. I do want to say something about that, the loss of parenting skills. I think that's a super important um, issue. And um, I, I, I could go into it quite a bit, but I'll just say, I, I really think that is an important legacy that, you know, a lot of kids did not get the um, materials, so to speak, that they needed um, to be um, successful parents. And that, that some of that um, has, has, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, lingered as a, as a result uh, of boarding schools, um, as well as other things like the change in diet. I mean, there's so many things that you know you can really look at. Now, that doesn't mean that boarding schools are to to blame for for every problem that exists, um, but um, I do think it's um, you know it's it's got lots of ups and downs. It's got lots of rabbit holes you can go down into when thinking about um, you know how this this system um, worked and how it's changed and and how I think it, it it I hope will continue to change for the better as, as do I well thank you again so much you are welcome back uh, anytime <laughs> and uh, I hope everybody can uh, join us again next month. Uh, for CJ Janovey's program, No Place Like Home, Lessons in Activism from LGBT Kansas. Uh, so she'll be talking about the story of a few disorganized and politically naive Kansans uh, who realized they were unfairly under attack, rolled up their sleeves, went looking for fights, and ended up making friends along the way. So from all of us here at Museum After Hours, good night, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone.